My name is Nancy Cutler, and I'm president of the Jewish Museum of Maryland. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our annual meeting. As we use this meeting to conclude this fiscal year and to look ahead to the next, I'd like to take just a minute to reflect some on the past 12 months. I can say with certainty that this past year was a year full of unprecedented challenges, but I'm also happy to report that we turned many of those challenges into opportunities. We started the year on July 1st, knowing full well that COVID was here to stay for quite a while. And with that realization, we rolled up our sleeves and we faced the challenges head on. While we didn't change our mission, our vision and our values, we changed the way that we do things in dramatic and long lasting ways. For one, we did the so-called pivot to digital or more appropriately, we called it an acceleration to digital. We offered a broad range of programs and activities virtually. And the result, attendance at live stream programs far outpaced our pre-COVID physical attendance. And we attracted a worldwide audience capturing viewers from 45 states and nine countries. Second, we found ways to bring the museum exhibits to the people when the people could not come to the museum building by offering virtual tours to individuals and groups. We targeted numerous synagogues and organizations in Baltimore and beyond. And they're concluding this year having provided 55 customized virtual tours. And not next, while we were unable to host school children in person as we have in the past, we found ways to continue providing curricular resources to teachers and offering professional development opportunities, strengthening our credentials as a community resource for Holocaust education and the struggles against anti-Semitism. And fourth, with growing racial injustice and increasing mistrust that divides our community, we committed ourselves to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice by placing a focus on these areas as evidenced in our board, our staff, our volunteers, our programs, and our audiences. And lastly, and certainly not the least of our challenges in this past year, was the search for a new executive director. While hiring an executive director during a pandemic initially seemed like a daunting task, we utilized the technology at hand and we succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. Sal Davis brings so much passion and creativity to the work, which you will see here later this evening in our program. While this has been uh, only a quick snapshot of the past year, I hope you can appreciate how we turn challenges into opportunities. It's been a pleasure serving as president this past year and I look forward to the year ahead. It's now my pleasure to introduce Beth Goldsmith, chair of the board of the Associated who will bring remarks on behalf of the Associated. Thanks, Nancy. I am so happy to be with you this evening. And although we're still virtual, at least hope's on the horizon that we'll start gathering in person again soon. I look forward to being at the museum and hearing about new exhibits. What a year it has been for this team at the Jewish Museum. As Nancy has just told you, you pivoted during these days of COVID-19 to ensure the vibrancy of Jewish life and learning continued remotely. You said goodbye to your treasured leader, Marvin Pinkert, and welcomed the new energetic executive director, Saul Davis. Well, change is inevitable, but this year was truly remarkable. What a story you have to tell on so many levels. As a beneficiary agency of the Associated, together we tell the story of Jewish Baltimore, enrich lives through education, and demonstrate that history, arts, and culture are critical to our community. It's our partnership and collaboration that enables the Associated to fulfill, fulfill its mission of a vibrant Jewish life for all. The Jewish Muse Museum holds a special place in the Associated Network. You're a leader in your neighborhood of Jonestown, you're committed to building a just world, and you create a welcoming space for all people to explore our rich culture and history. 
the museum has grown into a shining example of Baltimore's uniqueness and commitment to diversity and growth. And I'm delighted that the relationship between the Associated and JMM has never been stronger. Special thanks to Nancy, Nancy Cutler, on her first year as chair of the board and helping us to navigate the JMM through challenging days. Nancy has been a tireless advocate for both the museum and the associated, and we are deeply grateful. And we're thrilled that Sal Davis is here and already has been a wonderful partner and addition to our community. So thank you to all of you for being our partners and our storytellers. I look forward to working with all of you on Baltimore's road to recovery and ensuring creative and relevant programming for your neighborhood, for the Jewish community, and for all those seeking connection. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, I'd now like to call on Robert Keene, uh, immediate past president of the Jewish Museum and chair of the nominating committee to present this year's board slate. Thank you, Nancy. As you already know, tonight we will be hearing about the participatory museum model that our executive director, Dr. Saul Davis, envisions for the JMM. This year, as the nominating committee began to prepare a new slate, we developed a framing philosophy to guide our work. And I would like to take a moment to share it with you now. We want to foster diversity in all aspects of the museum's work. This will be cultivated through deep and meaningful relationships. As we embrace a broader board composition, we will attract a broader array of visitors and members to the JMM. Before I present the nominees, I would like to take a moment to thank my fellow committee members, Nancy Cutler, Duke Zimmerman, Abe Kronzberg, Bonnie Hennison, Ira Papel, Mike Saxon, Michelle Gordon, Saul Davis, and Tracy Dorfman. On behalf of the whole committee and in accordance with Article 2 and Article 5 of the JMM bylaws, I am pleased to present the slate of officers and board members which should now be appearing on your screens. Our new slate of officers elected annually and eligible to serve a maximum of four consecutive years. <coughs> JMM officers, Nancy Cutler, President, Jeffrey Scher, Vice President, Roberta Greenstein, Vice President, Jerry Max, Treasurer, Lola Hahn, Secretary, and Robert Keene, Immediate Past President. Current members of the JMM board to be reelected to a three-year term, Robert Manikin, Angela Wells-Sims, Stuart Rosenswag. Proposed new members of the board to be elected to a three-year term, Jordan Halley, Paul Levin, Jill Max, Abba Polakoff, and Harriet Wims. Current members of the JMM board to be reelected for one-year term presidential appointments. Suzanne Levin Lapidus, Ira Malice, and Claire Tesh. And I ask, do we have any additional nominations from the floor? With the Zoom, I guess I'm not hearing any, which is good. I ask for approval of the slate of officers and board members as recommended by the nominating committee. And please use your chat and put in I if you agree. And you know, the JMM, we've always had the unanimous um, approvals. So any opposed? None. The slate is approved. And of course, welcoming the new board means saying goodbye to others, to the trustees who will be departing their post this year. Though we can't raise a glass together in your honor tonight, we will be certain to find an opportunity to do so soon. First, we'd like to thank those who stepped down during the course of this year. Len Weinberg, Robert Slatkin and Erica Breslau. We wanna thank you for your support to the museum during this time on the board. And next, we would like to thank those whose terms are ending this year. The Honorable Ricky Spector and Judy Pacino. We thank you for being part of the JMM family, for your time and talent that you brought to the board. And of course, we hope that you stay in touch and there's always committee work for you to be done. 
So that concludes the official business and Saul, I turn it over to you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm Saul Davis. I'm delighted to be here with you all this evening. And I appreciate you choosing to be here in this Zoom room with us. I want to extend a hearty mazel tov and a stroke of gratitude to our board members, incoming, outgoing, and continuing. One of the things I learned quickly upon arriving, in fact, even before I arrived here in Baltimore in December, was that the JMM has a strong and deeply committed board of directors. And so much of our institutional strength comes from our robust board. So thank you to our board and thank you to our partners at the Associated. And my deepest thanks to our staff, the heartbeat, the daily pulse of the museum. Our staff has persevered through the challenges of COVID and major staff transitions. We have an amazing team of professionals and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this team. Over the course of my first four, or almost five months at the JMM, I've had many opportunities to speak about the participatory museum model that I embrace and that I bring to the work. Tonight, we will show more than tell. We will enact the participatory museum by bringing a range of voices and media into the presentation of our communal past, present, and dreams for the future. A participatory museum invites participation in all aspects of its work, and it purposefully prioritizes partnerships and relationship building. It actively participates in the neighborhood where it is located. All of these elements were already happening at the JMM when I arrived on the scene. Rather than tell the past from a singular authoritative perspective, the participatory museum actively seeks participation from across the expanse of the community to tell the history in intimate and inclusive ways. A participatory Jewish museum enriches the present by moving beyond representation and interpretation and toward an activation of Jewish values through its work and providing a platform and creating a space where Jewish arts and culture and life flourish. Jewish museums across the field are primarily focused on the past and with good reason. And I envision a Jewish museum that equally encourages deep, sustained and wild imagining of the Jewish future. What do we want Jewish communities to be and to hold 100 years from now? The JMM is committed to nurturing dreams about the Jewish future that we can active, so that we can actively begin to build that future world now. If we do not build the world of our dreams, then our descendants will live in the world of someone else's dreams. The focus on the past is a source where we can draw inspiration and strength. Museums like the JMM and the Jewish History Museum, where I previously worked in Tucson, Arizona, are unique institutions, Jewish museums who have a core function of preserving historic synagogues. And beyond preserving the physical structures, these museums hold histories that can help situate us in the present. These are histories that inform and can contextualize our current reality. I'm going to briefly share some examples from the Jewish American past that come to mind within this context. Rabbi Joseph Gumbiner led Congregation Temple Emmanuel in Tucson in the building where I previously worked. He led the congregation between 1942 and 1947. And in 1943, Rabbi Gumbiner led an interfaith group of clergy, along with a pastor at the neighboring AME uh, Prince Chapel Church in creating the Tucson Committee for Interracial Understanding. The congregational leadership responded by telling Rabbi Gumbiner that he had been hired to teach about Abraham and Isaac, not to make friends with the neighbors at the AME church. Here in Baltimore, I learned about an older history from the 1850s through 1861, almost 100 years earlier. And it bears many similar traces of some intercommunal tension. Rabbi David Einhorn, who served at Congregation Har Sinai, spoke and wrote forcefully in favor of abolition 
and against anti-immigrant political groups. And when violence erupted in Baltimore in April of 1861, Einhorn was forced to relocate to Philadelphia. Several months later, when he was ready to negotiate his return, the congregation requested that he avoid the topic of slavery. And Rabbi Einhorn refused to make that compromise, and he resigned from his post at Har, Har Sinai. Now, I raise these two examples because of their profound relevance and resonance with our present. And I raise them because they provide examples of moral courage, what Susan Sontag defines as something that puts one at variance with accepted practice. The museum is a place that can serve as a site where these histories, troubled and complex and inspiring, can be held, where we can come together to wrestle with the troubled past and our troubled present, where we can sit together and listen to each other, even when at times we disagree vehemently with one another, we can create a space where our humanity is held and cared for, even or especially when that happens within the crucible of disagreement. How does this fit within the participatory museum? What we are after is meaning making. And we want that meaning to be made through dialogue, and relationship building with one another. In other words, the Jewish Museum does not attempt to collapse our Jewish communities and Jewish people into simplicity or sameness. Rather, it seeks to tell our story in all of its diverse and multitudinous beauty and humanity. With that, I will turn it over to Jordan Halley. Thank you very much, Saul. Good evening, I'm Jordan Halley, one of the newly elected members of the board. So thank you very much for that. This evening, I'm pleased to present the first of three mini presentations you will be seeing during the program. All of these presentations reflect the participatory vision that Saul has already discussed. In this first video, we look to the past for inspiration. I think many of us recognize the importance of understanding our personal history and being able to access material that reflects that history, such as in the JMM collections. And let me tell you, if you think going down a rabbit hole on Wikipedia or something, wait till you find that there's some historical documents about your own family as part of that collection. In this first video, we will hear from two individuals who will be talking about the very different ways in which their ancestors have impacted their lives today, whether that be individual personality or a connection to Judaism. This piece represents just a small part of the new initiative that the JMM will soon roll out that aims to collect stories of the members of our community and their ancestors rooted in the medium of photography. I would like to tell you a little bit about my Nana my maternal grandmother, Stella Rosen, who uh, was born in London. When she was two, her family moved to Johannesburg, South Africa. When she was 10, they moved to the United States, to, to Boston. And after she married my grandfather, they made their way down to Baltimore. Hi, my name is Kitty Burns. And they're the ancestors, there's two people in the photo, are my great-great-grandparents. Abraham Becker and Krenda Blacker. My grandmother was quite uh, an interesting lady. She was very exuberant. She loved people. She was a great listener. Um, she had a bit of um, I don't know, a little impishness in her. And uh, there's a story that I love to tell about when she was a working um, girl. She was, this was before my grandfather married her. She was working in a department store in Boston and she um, was one of the sales girls on the floor. They had a uniform basically that they wore. It was a, a navy blue jumper and underneath that they had a white blouse they were to wear. And one day Stella went into work wearing a red blouse with a big red bow and the owner of the store came up to her and said, Stella, this this kind of attire will not do, it's too flashy. You are not to wear that red blouse under your jumper ever again. So the next day, my grandmother went into work with no blouse under her jumper. <laughs> 
And the owner of the store said, Stella, this won't do either. And I'm afraid I have to fire you. But he liked her very much. So he asked her to sit on his lap and gave her a piece of chocolate. <laughs> Abraham and Krenda came over with four of their youngest children. They had 10 children who were all in Baltimore. So it was a very large Jewish family in Baltimore. They were the last to come over from the Vilna area of Lithuania. They came from a shtetl named, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Crick. And they came um, over in 1892 through the port of Baltimore, Locust Point. And um, Abraham, my great, great Zeta was a shocket. And um, they settled in Baltimore and their kids, some of their kids had businesses in Baltimore. Um, uh, one of their sons, Herman Becker, had the Baltimore Sign Company, which was a, a pretty big and successful company. They lived on Lombard Street, really near the museum. Uh, they are buried at B'nai Israel Congregation Cemetery. Um, with many of their children and descendants are actually there. And um, my mom and I were lucky enough to um, come to the museum a couple of summers ago and see lots of archives uh, from their family that are at the museum, including that portrait, which I had never seen before. I mean, three years ago, I didn't even know that my great grandfather had any family in the United States whatsoever, let alone nine brothers and sisters and his parents. The impact my grandmother had on me and my family is something that brings tears to my eyes sometimes. She was the matriarch. She had a tremendous impact on everybody in the family. She was a, a very elegant looking woman. Um, she always would greet you with earrings and her lipstick on. So hence my earrings and lipstick. <laughs> um, but she um, had a wonderful, um, joie de vivre and a, and a gratitude for everything that came her way. So my sister and I were trained very early to always say please and thank you. Uh, and that those words basically, I think, helped form your outlook on life. So this sense of gratitude and showing appreciation to others is something that is very much ingrained in my family. Um, she, um, she was a great listener. She really understood how to draw people out and to really make them feel comfortable. And she had a great laugh. She was she just loved being with people. So I, I think that um, that kind of personality just had a tremendous impact on um, the fun my family had when we were together and just the beauty of, of having family. Finding out about my great great grandparents in Baltimore has had a significant impact on me uh, socially and actually spiritually, I would say. Um, socially, I have connected with many of my third cousins from this side of the family. As I mentioned before, I didn't even know um, that I had great, great grandparents uh, in the United States as of just a few years ago. And so being able to connect with many third cousins, I'm thinking, I have two third cousins that I'm pretty close with and keep up with regularly, and I've met countless others. Um, we have a small group on Facebook where we connect and talk about our family heritage, and um, everybody has a little bit of a story. I have email cousins that I've never met in person that I keep up with regularly, so it's really kind of connected me to a part of my family that I didn't think I would ever be connected to beyond my grandma who has been gone now for 21 years. So I often like think what she would have thought of me, like finding people in her family and uh, connecting to them in this way. And spiritually finding this part of the family has really connected me to uh, my Jewish roots. I grew up in a secular home and as an adult, um, I've always kind of tried to find a connection to um, my heritage. And this is 
the most successful way I've found to do that. I feel very connected to my Jewish ancestors and their stories and um, our family history. Thanks for setting that one up, Jordan. Now I'm pleased to introduce the superb musician, Ira Temple, who we are fortunate to be hearing from twice this evening. Ira Temple is a multi-instrumentalist, songwriter, and cultural worker. Recent credits include accordionist for Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish and music director of Indecent at the Weston Playhouse. Ira was a founder of the radical traditional Yiddish music group Sibylla, and for the last five years, music directed New York's biggest and most spectacular Purim spiel with Jews for racial and economic justice. Ira, please take it away. Thank you so much, Saul. Um, and so wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, the role of the musician at a time like this is a funny one. And I was really reminded in this transitional moment between past and future, between um, not being able to be together and looking forward to being together of Itzik Monger, a very important Ukrainian Polish playwright, um, songwriter, troubadour, uh, poet, uh, wrote a, an amazing song about loneliness. That's a little, that gives a little levity. Nobody knows what I say and nobody knows what I want. Keiner weiß net was ich so, keiner weiß net was ich will. Sieben meislich mit am Moi, schlafen auf den Deal. There are seven mice and one more mouse sleeping on the floor. I don't know about you, but that does actually accord with my COVID reality. Sieben meislich mit am Moi, schlafen auf den Deal. Sieben meislich mit am Moi, senen durch sich acht. Seven mice and one more mouse. Let's be real, that's eight mice. To ich on dem Kapelusch und sog da gute Nacht. So I put on my hat and I say, see you later. To ich on mein Kapelusch und sog da gute Nacht. But, you know, with just my hat, just my hat in the middle of the night, just by myself, where am I going to go? To ich on dem Kapelusch und ich los ich gehen. Wo je geht man spät bei Nacht, eine Kerr allein. Right? Just those mice and it's Sigmonger with his hat. To ich on dem Kapelusch eine Kerr allein. In the song, he goes to the bar and he's lonely there too. But I thought in this meeting, we could sing a little Yiddish welcome song to us at the meeting. Let's all welcome all of us, all of us friends. Let's all get together, let's be happy, and let's drink a glass of wine. Lomir alle in einem, in einem, die Mitgliedern, the members, all, all of us members, die Mitgliedern, makabel pun im sein, and the Meislich, die Meislich, makabel pun im sein, and let's welcome the museum, der Musei, makabel pun im sein. Lomir alle in einem, Lomir alle in einem, lustig und freilich sein. Lomir alle in einem, Lomir alle in einem, drinken a glazel of wine. I'm Claire Tesh, a member of the JMM board, and the next part of the program this evening focuses on the present. The JMM has been incredibly quick to respond to the challenges that we all faced over the past year. We're poised and committed to gathering, preserving, and sharing stories not only of the past, but also of the present. Recently, the Jewish Museum of Maryland developed a series of collecting initiatives under the title Preserving the Present 
that offered a variety of ways in which participants can add their voice to the historical record and help future generations understand this very turbulent time. You can read more about this using the link in the chat or directly from our collections team at the virtual reception, which is gonna follow this program. In a moment, you're gonna hear from three participants of this project who will share a little of their own experience. And then you're gonna hear from participants of another project this year in the absence of a proper morning. This installation and virtual exhibit developed in collaboration with LABA offered a public space for the expressions of loss and grief. The installation is still on display on the facade of the museum and is accessible on the museum's web, web page. There's a trigger warning. We want you to know that some of the um, pieces we're going to share may contain potentially disturbing or distressing material. So for those of you who may be grieving and looking for support, we will be sharing a link to find resources in the chat. And following these two pieces, we will again welcome Ira Temple for another musical interlude. So that's a big part that's been changed for us. We were people that went to shul every Shabbat. And so this is a big, it's a big change, but at, at, to some degree it's, we've sort of fallen into like a new normal of what Shabbat feels like along with everybody else in our community, we all used to do the same thing on Shabbat and now we still are, we're just doing it differently. Um, you know, I have a regular friend that I walk with every Shabbat morning and we pass the same pairs of friends who walk together also at that time every Shabbat morning. So in a way it's like we've created, like everyone's created this new uh, sort of Shabbat ritual, if you will. Um, uh, and and it's, it's really kind of developed into its own pattern. For Rosh Hashanah in the fall, like I didn't have to wake up early to go to shul. Um, but it really did mean a lot to get on Zoom and to see those people and do those things that I'm used to doing every year. And like uh, doing the Seder for Passover, going to some services for Rosh Hashanah, like I always would. Um, those kind of always like help me mark a year, I feel like. Um, and it would have been sort of disconcerting to not have them in my life. We are able to do things in ways we never thought we could. And coming together in this forum, in this format, on a Zoom call for a book club is nothing we ever did before. Um, and it's been really meaningful. And it led to not only conversations about race, um, but then it started to turn to, into, you know, more internal conversations. Well, what about race within our own congregation and the Jews of color in our own community? And wait a minute. You know, that moved us into other conversations about inclusivity in general for a variety of other uh, individuals, not to equate or uh, to say that one issue is more important or less important or the same as another, but it has led to um, further conversations about uh, gender issues and age differences in the congregation and single parents in the community and those who are deaf and those who are Jews of color or those who you know, find themselves politically or religiously or socially out or on the out or marginalized or lonely. Um, and of course, led to the larger issue of loneliness um, in our community. So, uh, you know, I, I think the important thing this summer has taught us was that we need to keep talking to each other and we need to keep seeing each other and, uh, and helping each other see beyond the four walls of our community. Um, but using that also as an opportunity to turn back and see within those four walls in a, in a very different way too. So for me as a teacher, I mean, it's entirely flipped my job around. Um, and all the things I love about my job are really hard to come by now. And all the things that I like didn't particularly like about my job are like what I spend all day doing. So you know, more specific. I am. Can you be more specific? So okay. checking email, not my favorite part of my job, but now I get like a million emails a day because that's how we communicate about everything. Um, interacting with students um, and just like chatting with them in the hallways, even outside of class is one of my favorite things because teenagers are ridiculous. Um, in a good way. In a good way. 
but we don't get to do that anymore. You know, like occasionally we chat, you know, about non-class related things, but it's, it's harder to come by. But I think, you know, people are resilient and, you know, humankind has gotten through these kinds of things before. And so if people are facing the similar kind of thing in 20 years and 50 years, we probably will, or even in a hundred years, another hundred years, um, you know, to certainly look back on, uh, you always want to learn from the people that came before you and look at the lessons and the the mistakes that we've made. And hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully you can do better. <laughs> she wasn't getting better. Her lungs were, it was all focused on her lungs, 100%. Nothing else was impacted, but her lungs were just getting deteriorated. And she was, every day she just was losing, losing more oxygen. In the meantime, as all that's happening, my communication with her is very hard because she's wearing this full face mask, which is a BiPAP mask to be able to pressure, help her pressure breathe. And, you know, I can barely hear her, but I have to say that the nurses and the people around her were amazing about getting us, you know, connected whenever we can. But when she was at Jacksonville, she started to get less and less lucid and she was starting to, you know, it was clear that, that the end was coming. So they arranged a Zoom call. And um, it was the last time seeing her. She joked because I had my COVID beard at the time and I said, Do you see my beard? And she goes, oh, you look so pretty. And then we were just talking to the nurses about her, what, what we're going to do. And she, my sister literally raised her hand. She says, oh, I'm not gone yet. But she was. And that uh, was the last time I spoke to her. I saw her. I just felt loss. I just felt grief. I just felt we were robbed because of COVID and this pandemic to say goodbye. We didn't have the tools that we do in our culture of mourning. You know, we didn't have those three days of um, weeks and coming together and sharing your loss, I felt robbed of that. And uh, I couldn't hug or cry on the shoulders of the people I needed to. And to know that she died alone, nobody saying goodbye to her. Nobody had talked to her in two days. It's painful knowing that. And to know someone and so many of our 500,000 people we lost died, many of them, if not most of them, alone in a hospital with tubes hooked around them. I'm a retired nurse, so I have seen death. And I had the opportunity to be with many who died alone, but I was there holding their hand and talking to them. So I know those nurses were with those people who didn't have family at their bedside, and that's a comfort. You know, I think the hard part was when we came home, so we traveled to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, you know, for the funerals, and when we came home, there was nothing. So none of our friends, there's just kind of nothing. And we do have some very good friends in Baltimore that were said it's nice out we'll meet you in the courtyard we'll bring food so some of those traditional things where people are around and they bring you food and you don't have to worry about things our friends did for us but all outside so it was really hard because my friends were like put your mask on I'll hug you from the side you know we won't um we weren't able we felt the support and we were thankful for the support but it felt so remote and removed that it was definitely um, different. And so I really feel for all the people that had to go through this during COVID because the traditions, whatever they are, are just hard to navigate through social distancing, mask wearing, people being afraid to come out in person. So, you know, we had several people that stopped by and we sat in the courtyard or they took a walk with us. Just kind of new traditions, I guess. 
new way to support people? All of us who have been dispersed and scattered, wrote Shinansky, folklorist and author. We swear an oath to each other. We're dispersed, but heaven and earth will hear us, and the stars will bear witness to our flag, stained red with blood, and our oath of tears. Brüder und Schwester von Arbeit und Neid alle, was seinen, sie seht und sie spricht. Zusammen, zusammen, die von sie ist gräht. Sie flattert von Zorn, von Blut ist sie reu. A schwue, a schwue, auf Leben und Teut. Himmel und Erdwelt, unser Eis, Herrn, edes Feld sein. Die lichtige Stern, a Schwoe von Blut und a Schwoe von Tränen. Mir schweren, mir schweren, mir schweren. Wow, that smiles. Uh, thank you so much for bringing that music into our meeting, Ira. Now we're going to turn our attention to imaginings about the future of Jewish community. The JMM recently undertook an initial trial of a new collecting effort titled 2121 Ancestral Dreaming. The concept includes a series of prompts aimed at provoking thoughts and hopes and dreams of our communal future. Ancestral dreaming draws inspiration from an image within African American culture that declares, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. What are our dreams now for Jewish life in the year 2121? In this survey, we ask questions like, which ancestor would you invite back into the living world with you? Can you please share why? And what are your wildest dreams for Jewish communities in the year, in the US, in the year 2121? 2121 Ancestral Dreaming, it will create space to voice our claims to the future. It refuses the foreclosure of our future into a single trope. Ancestral Dreaming is a place full of what ifs. It's a place that will fire our imaginations and draw inspiration from the best of our pasts while not allowing our imaginations to be limited by what has been. 2121 Ancestral Dreaming is a communal conjugation into the future tense. Through this survey, we commissioned a piece of art to be created by a local artist to represent some of the future visions we received. That local artist is Leora Ostroff. Leora Ostroff is a Baltimore-based painter. Her work explores themes such as queerness, Jewishness, violence, and the idiosyncrasies of life in Baltimore. She's exhibited work in Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Milwaukee, and has been published in Protocols. Her community at Hinenu, the Baltimore Justice Stiebel, nourishes her art practice and has inspired her to explore Jewish no notions of justice and art 
via collaborative writing and performance. Leora graduated from the Maryland Institute College of Art in 2016 with a BFA in art. All right. Um, Leora, before we see the piece that you created, can you please share with us some of the themes that stood out when you were reading through the responses that we received through the ancestral dreaming surveys? Yeah, so um, question three was describe the world you would like for your descendants um, to inhabit in the year 2121. And the first thing that struck me was that half of the responses to this question related to environmental concerns. So we hoped that our planet survives and for a world with clean water, clean air and food that honors the earth and that is built around sustainability for all living organisms and that is first and foremost habitable by humans. Um, and then question four was, what are your wildest dreams for Jewish communities in the US in the year 2121? Um, and it seemed to me that the responses to this question were split between concerns about how the Jewish community would relate to the world around it, for instance, wishing for a world without anti-Semitism um, and utterly insular desires. So we wished for like a new Sanhedrin, um, perhaps changes to Jewish law and freedom and how Judaism is expressed. Um, and the last thing that struck me is how it seemed that some of the responses to these questions were sort of analogous to what I would imagine a lot of Jews would have written 100 years ago in 1921 when they were dreaming of kibbutzim or integration and assimilation and individual spiritual freedom around the time that um, some modern denominations were being founded. All right. Um, can you please share the piece that you painted and talk us through it a little bit? Yes. Um, so um, the responses to the questions reminded me of the story of Pony and the Carib Tree, which is a story from our sages. Um, and it came to mind because this story is commonly read on Tubi Shvat, which celebrates um, trees and agriculture. Um, and in modern times is kind of sometimes referred to as like a Jewish Earth Day. Um, and the story of Honey teaches us that we're responsible for building and planting and stewarding the future for our descendants. Um, so uh, in my painting, Honey falls asleep in the year 2021. Um, so I'm going to read the, sto the story of Honey briefly um, to you all. Um, so Honey sat, oh, oops. So Honi is, is a rab, is uh, one of the sages. So one day Honi was walking along the road when he saw a certain man planting a carob tree. Honi said to him, this tree, after how many years will it bear fruit? The man said to him, it will not produce fruit until 70 years have passed. Honi said to him, is it obvious to you that you will live 70 years that you expect to benefit from this tree? He said to him, that man found himself a world of carob, full of carob trees. Just as my ancestors planted for me, I too am planting for my descendants. Honey sat and ate bread. Sleep overcame him and he slept. A cliff form, formed around him and he disappeared from sight and slept for 70 years. When he awoke, he saw a certain man gathering carobs from the tree. Honey said to him, are you the one who planted this tree? The man said to him, I am his son's son. Honey said to him, I can learn from this that I have slept for 70 years. And indeed he saw that, it, that his donkey had sired several herds during those many years. Um, so uh, in my painting, Honey has fallen asleep in the year 2021. He's holding his phone, he has a mask on his ear. Um, and I wondered what he would see when he woke up. Um, and uh, so so I, I took those responses and I imagined that Honey would see a world of greenery and abundance um, and a world of freedom and expression and the continuance of Jewish traditions um, and identity. So beautiful. Thank you, Leora. I mean, and the word abundance too is one of the things that I'm really hoping to see um, through the 2121 Ancestral Dreaming Initiative to really imagine a world, not a world of uh, fear or scarcity, but one of abundance. 
Um, so thanks, Leora, for sharing your artistry and that powerful story and teaching. And thanks to all for joining us this evening. If we were at the museum, this is the moment we would transition to a reception with food and drink and conversation. And while we can't provide food or drink tonight, we would like to invite you all to join us for a virtual reception that'll take place on a separate Zoom meeting immediately following this event. So here you'll have the chance to connect with other attendees and with members of the JMM team to learn more about the different areas uh, of the museum. You should have received an email a few moments ago, likely around 7.30, it should have hit your inboxes that has the Zoom information to access the Zoom meeting for the virtual reception. After you leave this webinar, you can use the information in that email to access the reception. If you did not receive a copy of this email and would like to join us for the reception, please stay in this webinar after we wrap up and a member of the team will be on hand to help anyone who is having issues uh, accessing the reception. Thank you all again for joining us for our 2021 virtual annual meeting. We hope to see many of you shortly at our virtual reception and again at programs in the future.